Hello everyone, I'm Jeffrey Cameron. I'm Director of Public Affairs for the Baha'i Community of Canada, and I'm also a member of the Program Advisory Committee for Democracy Exchange. And it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to this session, Faith as a Vehicle for Dialogue, A View from the Hill. So on this panel, we'll have members of parliament from three political parties who are going to talk about how to promote a constructive relationship between religion and democracy in Canada. Despite many differences among religions and spiritualities in Canada, there are underlying principles that are shared across faiths and philosophies that can serve to strengthen democratic processes and enrich our public discourse. And I hope that this conversation will help us to identify some of these concepts and principles and illuminate how they can promote a dialogue across party lines. More specifically, this conversation will address uh, current efforts underway to create an all-party interfaith caucus in Ottawa, uh, a forum to promote constructive dialogue between religious groups and parliamentarians on issues of shared concern. Before I hand things over to our moderator, I just want to note that this session is being recorded and will be distributed after Democracy Exchange to participants, uh, only that the speakers will be visible in the video. You're also welcome to participate in this conversation after the panel portion. You'll see a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen that you can use to send questions to the speakers, and we'll do our best to address them within the time allotted. There's also a chat box to the right, uh, which allows you to interact with other some of the participants. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our moderator and speakers to this panel. Dr. John Malloy is director of the Center for Public Ethics at Martin Luther University College, and he'll be moderating. Our panelists include Anthony Housefather, Member of Parliament for Mount Royal, Garnet Genuis, Member of Parliament for Sherwood Park for Saskatchewan, and Elizabeth May, Member of Parliament for Sandwich Gulf Islands, is attempting to join right now, and we hope she'll make an appearance uh, very soon once some technical issues have been resolved. So now, John, I'll hand things over to you. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff. Good morning, everyone. As you heard, my name is John Malloy. I'm the director of the Center for Public uh, Ethics at Martin Luther University College, the founding institution of Wilfrid Laurier University. As well as being director of a center concerned with the intersection between faith, politics, and public policy, I'm also a retired politician. I served for 11 years in the Ontario legislature, seven of them in cabinet, and was always quite open about the important role my Catholic faith played in my work as a political representative. Now, I came to Queen's Park after having spent a number of years on Parliament Hill as a political staffer, including five in the Prime Minister's office, and here too saw faith as playing a positive role in helping me fulfill my duties. All that said, I'm the first to acknowledge that there are some very loud voices out there demanding that our politicians check their faith at the door before entering elected life and that the views of faith communities have no role to play in the public square. With literally millions of Canadians considering themselves persons of faith, this is an important issue to discuss and I think a fitting issue for a conference like Democracy Exchange. And I'm delighted that we're joined today by a number of thoughtful politicians who have reflected on these issues and are prepared to discuss both the role that personal faith plays in their work, as well as share their views on the role that people of faith and faith communities can play to help shape public policy. And a very, very brief commercial, tomorrow at this time at 11 o'clock as part of Democracy Festival, we're going to have some responses from faith leaders across Canada, and there's more information on the festival uh, outline. So I want to join Jeff in welcoming our uh, uh, very distinguished panel and uh, start by posing a question to each one about this proposal to form an all-party interfaith caucus. And maybe I'll begin with uh, Garnet Genuis. Um, you've been a, a politician unafraid to speak about your faith and how it influences public life. You've been a key driver behind the idea of an all-party uh, faith caucus. Perhaps you can speak a little bit about the vision behind it and some of the steps uh, going forward. Well, sure. First of all, uh, thank you very much uh, to Democracy Exchange for, for putting this together and for the opportunity to, to share a few thoughts. Um, I, I think, you know, your, your introduction is, is very interesting and, and very worthwhile. Um, I, I think one of the, the most important things we can say to demystify the role that uh, a personal faith can play in, in, in uh, uh, the, the work of a politician is to say that all of us bring 
uh, prior philosophical commitments to our political work. Uh, we bring ideas about justice, about human dignity, about human rights. Uh, and that is just as true, uh, can be just as true for people who are not uh, in, in a uh, traditional sense religious people. Uh, and in fact, we would hope it would be true. Uh, people that come into politics without any prior political uh, uh, philosophical commitments who are simply prepared to uh, deliver whatever lines they are given, uh, parrot whatever kind of messages that they are told to, to parrot without any uh, deeper sense of, of what is just, what is right, what is what is the kind of the guiding star of their political activity. I, I think people without those kind of prior commitments can in fact be uh, be quite dangerous. So whether whether it comes from a commitment to a, a notion of, of a higher good that, that comes from or is intertwined with faith, or whether it's a, a notion of, of uh, the, the common good that has some other uh, defined origin. Uh, I think we, we, we all expect and hope that, that politicians are not merely creatures of the, the day-to-day push and pull of the environment, but are actually trying to bring some deeper ideas and values uh, to the table. And I mean, I think some of the, the fear around uh, people of faith and in being involved in politics is that it, it brings a, a certain tribalism, that I as a Catholic uh, will sort of only defend the interests of Catholics and be hostile to the, uh, to the, the concerns of, of Jews or Muslims or, or uh, Protestants even. Um, you know, but, but, but in reality, faith is not a, a tribal identity. It's a commitment to a set of principles. Uh, and you know, for me, my Catholic faith leads me to be very vocal and active on issues of human rights, uh, including, uh, and, and in, in recent cases in particular, speaking out about cases uh, such as those involving Uyghur Muslims, people that are not part of my own uh, faith community, but nonetheless who I uh, am am informed by my faith to see the, the value and dignity of. So uh, I think it's, this is a, a great conversation to, to bring out some of those points, uh, demystify the positive role that faith can play in people's lives. Now, now just that's sort of responding to the introduction, but just, just to, the, to the question about the role of an interfaith caucus, um, I, I think dialogue among members of parliament about these issues uh, and the organization of events to, to, to demonstrate uh, the fact that our democracy is better when people bring uh, their prior commitments to, to ideas about justice and human dignity uh, into the politics that, are, that our democracy is strengthened through that kind of a contribution. I, I think people need to hear that. Uh, they need to, to know that. And it's something that we can discuss uh, across across party lines. And and I think hopefully in in this kind of nascent caucus we can have dialogue that um, that reflects those deeper commitments. If people are told that they cannot talk about their their deeper commitments when they come into the political process, uh, then we're going to have less meaningful, more superficial conversations. So this is an opportunity to have, I think, deeper, more substantive conversations where people are, are bringing the fullness of who they are and their philosophical commitments into what they're talking about. No, that's great. Thank you very much. I want to get Elizabeth May to, uh, to jump in. Uh, we apologize, lots of technical difficulties on these things, but welcome. Do you want to pick up uh, 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 with what Garnet was saying about, about how you came to this issue, but also maybe a little bit more of the, uh, uh, the steps going forward on this all-party caucus and how you see it functioning and how you see it breaking down barriers? Well, I, I'm very much in support. Thank you, John, and thanks to the organizers. And Jeff, thank you for finally sending me a Zoom link that let me in. I'm not, I mean, I'm not a Catholic, but I'm, I am aware of limbo, and I was just in it. So I'm <laughs> glad I was able to actually join all of my, my parliamentary colleagues. So, um, yeah, I've been uh, very keen on an all uh, it, it, on an, uh, an interfaith, uh, interreligious dialogue among parliamentarians just because I'm generally in favor of an interreligious dialogue within society. We learn more from, from sharing in our faith lives. I've never understood politicians who could say, and I've heard some say it, that their faith doesn't influence their views on policy. I think we need to be clear with voters, and this is where I come, uh, come to this discussion, is that I'm, I'm, I think there's absolutely uh, very sound and good reasons for a separation of church and state. This isn't that. I think actually that when Jesus said, render under Caesar what is Caesar's, that was a very good description of separating church and state, you know? So it's not to say that our religious beliefs should control any government decision-making, but I think it's less than honest 
when you're running for office, if you don't share with voters what your perspectives on the world uh, are and how they may be informed by your faith. And I think um, uh, Garnet just made that point that, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it doesn't motivate him to only protect people of his own faith in a tribal sense. Absolutely. And Garnet is, is um, like Anthony and like uh, many of us in Parliament who stand up on human rights, quite often we're informed from a faith perspective. Uh, a lot of the uh, uh, participants in this morning's call may not know that we have a, a national prayer breakfast and we have a weekly prayer breakfast within Parliament every Wednesday morning. It, but it is essentially um, around those who are followers of Jesus Christ, which immediately excludes a whole lot of very, very important voices and, and perspectives. So I think an interreligious approach would be really beneficial. Uh, it is, uh, I think, um, it reflects, it gives, it gives a lot of Canadians a way to reflect on who we are as parliamentarians and what issues we work on to understand that whether you're Baha'i or Jewish or Christian or Sikh or Muslim or what have you, our parliament reflects people of faith. And we don't generally express ourselves in that way for fear of um, offense, that's for sure, and uh, for fear of being typecast. I mean, I'm, I, 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 I find it, and I think John made that point earlier, we're not encouraged to speak as a person of faith. Um, I have to say that I think the Christian left is significantly underrepresented in public discourse. So as soon as I say, look, I'm a practicing Christian, there's a whole pile of assumptions that come in with that. And I think the more that we're able to reflect on what motivates us as individuals, if it's from faith, if it's, and obviously it's critical that people who have no faith are just as vigorously defended in their rights as people of different faith perspectives. So those are just a few comments off the top, but I, I'm very much in favor of us continuing to have a discussion of the, way, the ways in which uh, faith informs the work we do as individuals. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Anthony Housefather, I want you to jump in. Obviously your, your thoughts on the general discussion, but I'm also wondering, the view from the outside is that things are very, very polarized on, on Parliament Hill. There's not a lot of meaningful cross-party dialogue. How do you see this uh, 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 type of, of forum allowing for a little bit more uh, of that dialogue? But the flip side is, how do you do it? And, and you know, Elizabeth May spoke about the separation from church and state. How do you sort of weigh the two uh, together? And welcome. Thank you very much. And it's a pleasure always to be with Garnet and Elizabeth, who I, uh, I, I, I'm very fond of. Um, I, I think that one of the things that's really important uh, to come to the second question is that there are two very opposite concepts. There is freedom of religion, and then there is separation of church and state. And people confuse the two. Freedom of religion means that if I want to work for the state, and I want to wear a kippah, or wear a turban, or wear a hijab, I should be allowed to do so. The idea that some people make that because the state and church are separate, you shouldn't be allowed to practice your religion and work for the state is not our Canadian tradition at all. And in fact, in the United States, where there is a much stronger separation of church and state than in Canada, where we can have, for example, a Christmas tree and a menorah in front of City Hall and in the United States, religious symbols like a creche are not allowed in front of City Hall, um, they would be shocked at the idea that somebody would advance that separation of church and state means that you can't practice your religion and work for the state. So we have to be really clear that in Canada, you have an absolute right, subject to reasonable limits to practice your religion and be part of politics and be in the House of Commons or be a civil servant or be anything else and the state shouldn't stop you from doing that. What separation of church and state is supposed to mean is that no religion is preferred over another religion or over someone who has no religion and nobody should be tested before they occupy a political office by being required to swear an oath on the Bible of one faith versus another. And too often people distort and misuse this to believe that you can't have any religious faith and be in politics. And I think that's really important. And as to dialogue, I think it's so important. We're way too partisan in Ottawa. I think that's true in all parties. We often apply lessons to the other party that we wouldn't apply to our own. 
and we get into groups of tribal uh, people yelling at one another. And the more that we have relationships across party lines, and whether that's brought together through sports, and I, 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 I'm a very big sports person, and I swim with Elizabeth, and I, and I swim with people of all parties, and I run with people of all parties, and it brings us closer together. The same is true of talking about our different faiths. We better understand one another and where we come from, and we create relationships that then make it more difficult for people to yell at one another when it comes to a contentious committee meeting. So I think it's a great idea. I have to say, Anthony only aspires to my level of athleticism. It's, it's something. <laughs> Anthony is actually a really, really competitive athletic swimmer. But I, but I was just want to share one interreligious dialogue moment that uh, forever cements my fondness for Garnet. And we, we, we agree on many things, but there's a few areas of strange divergence in our friendship. But we actually celebrated an Easter mass together in Bethlehem, in the Church of uh, the Nativity, in a, at a Catholic service, and I'm not, I'm a, as I say, Anglican, and we were at a service that was glorious and entirely in Arabic. And we were able to, you know, the Hoshanas, we knew where we were. We were, we were in, in a, a moment of celebrating resurrection in as cross-cultural a context as, as one can imagine. And I do think it was, it was, a, it was an all-party tour of, of um, Palestine. But it was a really, um, it was one of those things that says, you know, sharing faith is something that across party lines can make a, can make a difference in, uh, as Anthony says, understanding each other more, appreciating each other's depths. And, and the, I mean, no human being is, is, is unidimensional. And uh, the partisanship uh, tends to want to make people unidimensional, like we're just all cardboard cutouts for our leader. No, really, parliament and democracy are enriched when we're willing to open up in, in our vulnerabilities and the spaces uh, where we see eye to eye and uh, because we're looking at things with a lens that says, uh, it may be out of fashion to say that something's morally right or wrong, but maybe sometimes you have to say it. And maybe I'll just uh, add to that. I, I agree with most of what was said, although I certainly disagree about coming together around athletics. I think that's a terrible idea. I think it's better to get together at the bar and more substantive conversations can happen there. Um, on the, uh, I, I, Anthony's alluding to uh, what we see as I think the, this, this encroaching movement to restrict people's consciences, uh, people's ability to practice their, their faith uh, if they want to serve the public. And uh, I would just uh, make the case for the importance of a uh, continuous ethic of protecting conscience. And I've, I've been uh, vocal in my opposition to Bill 21. Um, I mean, I, as an Alberta MP, it's, uh, you know, it, it, I think it, maybe Anthony's voice counts for more on those issues. But, um, but you know, it's, it's, it's something that I've, that I've said and I've spoken out and also defended the idea that, uh, for instance, people should uh, be able to still be a physician, still run a hospice, um, still provide uh, health care while opting out of participating in uh, procedures and activities that, that, uh, that are contrary to their their faith conscience includes uh, what you wear externally as religious symbols but also what you have internally uh, and I think this is this is a, a robust concept of religious freedom that we have to have to defend recognizing not only that it's important to protect people's freedoms but also that allowing people to participate fully in different professions uh, enriches those professions. I mean, without, without uh, robust protection for, for religious freedom, uh, you could exclude whole swaths of people of certain faith or philosophical backgrounds from being in the teaching profession, from being in the medical profession. Uh, and how much weaker is the experience of a student going through school if they, uh, if they miss the opportunity to have a, any teacher who brings a particular strong faith perspective from from one direction or another so we we believe in defending people's freedoms not just because respecting them as individuals is important but because it is consistent with a belief in the common good that uh that we have a plurality of different backgrounds in forming different professions uh, and that is just as true of politics as it is of other professions like medicine and teaching and one uh, one example if i may just jump in as well is that you know where we came together when we were studying the medically assisted dying legislation in the last parliament, 
at the Justice Committee, we came together and unanimously through all parties, uh, including Elizabeth, who was there, even though she didn't have a vote, uh, adopted a provision to put into the medically assisted dying legislation saying that no person can be compelled to participate in medically assisted dying, whether a pharmacist or a doctor or a nurse. Um, and, 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 and that was important to preserve individual conscience uh, because I do agree with Garnet, provided that if the state requires that a procedure be done, any public institution be required to provide that procedure, it doesn't mean that an individual working with the, within that institution should be compelled to participate in something that goes against their conscience. And I think that's where a balance always needs to be discussed and worked on. And it's much better if you can come together across party lines to do that. And one example was indeed in that legislation, which was very contentious, and people of faith had strong uh, positions, uh, very divergent on that legislation. But we did find a way to protect conscious rights uh, by coming together uh, on, on, on one amendment to that bill. Yeah, I, and I think, Anthony, as you know, I mean, we're, we're going to disagree subtly in that I, I don't think the conscience protections in that bill are, are nearly robust enough. But I, I mean, I, I take the point that there, that, there, uh, that there was some consensus on at least taking a step in that direction. So. Can, can I, I think this is a good, a good entryway into, into sort of the next uh, topic that I wanted to uh, discuss, because obviously uh, faith communities came forward on, on that bill, faith communities come forward on a whole range of uh, uh, issues. And I, I certainly echo what Elizabeth May said, it's not always just the, the, the hot button issues are coming forward in the environment, on, on poverty, on, on just so many, many important issues to them. And I'm just wondering, as politicians, what has been your experience in dealing with faith communities and how have you seen them uh, uh, make a contribution? And I, you know, obviously there are some, the assisted dying, but also beyond that in some of these, uh, these uh, uh, issues related to, to poverty and the environment and things like that. And I don't know, maybe, maybe Elizabeth, I'll, I'll, I'll start with you. Certainly the, the ties between a lot of faith communities and the environment is, is one that I see and, and maybe you wanna pick up on that. Well, also, I mean, it's certainly on the on the front of guaranteed livable income and the anti-poverty caucus, which is both uh, uh, both sides of parliamentarians, both House and Senate. And I see among our participants, Joe Gunn, who I know has come to testify to and, and join that committee. I know a lot of participants here, if I was to keep searching through the list, have been active coming from a place of faith, uh, organizations calling for corporate responsibility. That's another place where we have an ongoing issue because the government created the uh, um, Canadian Ombudsman for um, Responsible Enterprise, but hasn't given them any tools to do that work yet. But that's one that also grew out of some of the interfaith and interreligious groups that do advocacy around human rights. So human rights, uh, anti-poverty work, definitely, as, as you say, John, I mean, I think I, I view creation as sacred. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm uh, you know, I, my, one of my favorite lines of all time was from a, a US Senator from Arkansas named Dale Bumpers. And back in the day when I worked in the Mulroney government, uh, we were in, we were at a big US Congress uh, conference on conservation. And so Senator Dale Bumpers said, why is it whenever we destroy something man-made, we call it vandalism. And whenever we destroy something God-made, we call it progress. Uh, there, there's something about a, a, you know, a good old boy Southern approach to <laughs> what is it we're doing to, to, to our natural world. Um, and it crystallizes for me, obviously, um, we, we do want to use uh, what is in sacred creation for our economy. But there's a, there's a question of how much are we allowed and I think it's a moral position and a, and a question that really should challenge our generation. Are we allowed to destroy the life chances of our children? I, I, I think the answer to that is no, uh, but uh, there are a lot of different p perspectives on faith that come to that question. I mean, there's a very active group um, of evangelicals in the US working on climate action, and they tend to find themselves uh, in a in a space where people don't expect them to be the voice for climate action, but but they draw on their face to say, yeah, no, actually, that's where I come to this. So, but again, I, I'm always cautious to add in that um, there uh, there's uh, in politics, and certainly I belong. All of us belong to different political parties. None of our parties would ever suggest for a moment 
that atheists don't have a, a place of respect and full cooperation in whatever work we're doing in the public sphere. The question is, having had a, a history in our Judeo-Christian tradition of Western democracies of a domination of the public space by one set of assumptions about faith, can we, as we become although I, you know, we're described as a secular society. I, I, I have a friend who's Buddhist, uh, Peter Timmerman at York, who put forward the view that we're actually not a secular society. We actually worship the economy. But you know, we, as we're increasingly pushed in the direction of thinking there's no space in the public sphere for people of faith, that's where I think we have to stand up and say, there's still space for us. We don't dominate. We don't have the same set of automatic assumptions. Uh, it's so clear when you compare U.S. politicians, as the one I was just mentioning, to Canadians, it, you, you're just not going to be elected president, even if you're a flagrant violator of every Ten Commandment he can find. Donald Trump has to profess that he is, in fact, I mean, his getting COVID was a gift from God. That kind of thing you would not hear a Canadian politician say, because we have been, our, our worldview and what's viewed as acceptable in the public sphere has changed. I think it needs to, as, as this conversation suggests, I think we need to make sure there is space, that's all, space for an interreligious dialogue that doesn't seek to control or tell people what they must believe, but say, well, this is what I believe, and this informs what I do. Just in defense of Donald Trump, I don't know if there's evidence that he's ever worshipped a graven image. So uh, maybe, <laughs> there's, that, maybe... there's that gold bolt at the stock exchange. What do you think? Oh, well, yeah, okay. Um, well, just um, if I can maybe build off uh, what, what Elizabeth said. The, um, I think it's a very important point that people of faith bring sort of a multiplicity of different uh, issue, issue concerns. And that is, um, uh, that, that, is that, that can be missed by, by both sides. I think so, sometimes you, you have people that, that uh, kind of are in politics and they want to really hype up the partisan identity and they say, okay, uh, I'm a Christian, therefore uh, religious liberty and protection of, of uh, human life at all stages. Then you have other people saying, I'm a Christian, therefore climate and poverty. Um, and I think a lot of everyday people who are outside of politics, uh, who are people of faith, uh, they bring all of these concerns to the table and they don't, they don't like this sort of hyper-partisanship, which says you have to be concerned with either one set of things uh, or, or another set of things. And, and my challenge to anyone, not just people of faith, I mean, but people with deep, deep convictions that are formed by, uh, informed by a, a sense of, of justice and human dignity is to uh, be a gadfly in your own party, right? If you are a, uh, if you're a, a, a Catholic on the left, um, you know, absolutely uh, stand up on issues of poverty, but also stand up on issues of, of conscience. And if you're a Catholic on the right, uh, challenge your own party on issues of, of uh, uh, you know, w whatever you think is maybe not the, the issue in, 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 in vogue. Um, in my own uh, political career, uh, I have uh, done this to some extent on issues of, uh, of criminal justice reform. So I was uh, the only conservative to vote against a private member's bill uh, that would have uh, imposed a life sentence without the possibility of parole uh, in, in certain kinds of cases. Uh, and I, and I, I voted differently from my colleagues because I uh, have this sort of Christian informed belief that people can change. Uh, and obviously, we need to uh, protect society and keep people in prison who are a continuing danger to society. Uh, but to have uh, on a first offense life with no chance of parole, um, I think there were various practical problems with it. But it also, I think, failed to fail to express the reality uh, that that people can experience dramatic conversion, transition, change in their life, uh, and and that we, sh we should hold out hope for that possibility, even in the lives of people that have committed uh, serious crimes. So uh, I, I think we, we, we don't want to have religion just be an excuse for people to further entrench themselves in their existing political tribes. Rather, we want people to be challenging their own tribes uh, on, on different sides of, uh, of, of, of different questions. Uh, you know, whether that's... Uh, you know, being a whatever that looks like, uh, you can you can be part of a, a part of a political party while still challenging it uh, and and pushing back against aspects of its orthodoxy that that contradict with uh, a, a deeper sense of the of the common good. 
Can I, I want to, I want to get Anthony in, but uh, Garner, can you talk about some of the, um, the faith communities or, or faith organizations that you think have, have been effective in, in, in bringing forward or perhaps working with you or working with others, bringing forward these views? Um, I, I, I would be reluctant to go down the road of sort of naming organizations just for fear of kind of missing some and, um, you know, and I, I, I don't want to be seen to identify groups that I don't think are doing it, it, it as well, for example. I mean, but I, I look, I, I think there are there are a lot of different groups who are trying to uh, bring the voice of people of faith. And sometimes there's there's groups that, that include sort of a broader community uh, that is both the more and the less religious within that community. Uh, there, there are many different groups that are that are doing it well. And I, I, I'd say I think the groups that are doing it best uh, are the ones that are uh, working collaboratively with politicians that don't see themselves as there to to call people out uh, for for moments of error or heresy, um, but but that also are pushing hard on issues uh, across across the spectrum, uh, a spectrum of issues, a spectrum of parties, uh, and I think you know there are. Um, I mean, I'll just I'll just use you know w one example uh, from the Muslim community. I mean, there is a there is a perception out there, uh, and I I would say it's a very very much a false perception. But there's a perception out there that there's this sort of divide between conservatives and and Muslims. In reality, there are, there are many uh, Muslim people in our conservative party who are who are active, who are informed by their faith, and who who who, who support our our, our party. Uh, and you know, I, I've had very effective ongoing engagement and dialogue with some. Muslim community organizations who just understand the importance of uh, of not being uh, pigeonholed into one partisan category, but of engaging uh, across the political spectrum of of, of working with all parties. Uh, and I th I'd say that's important for uh, for all communities. I thought I would get through it without doing that, talking while muted. Anthony, you've been very, uh, uh, you've been very uh, uh, patient. So we want to hear you, your views on this uh, uh, question to comment on what the others have said, but also your, your interactions with faith communities. Well, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm listening to such, uh, you know, such gold from Elizabeth and Garnet. I mean, I, I don't need to intervene at that point, but uh, I, I mean, I think the best advice that I can give uh, to faith communities is to participate in the public discourse, but not to do so from a very sectarian lens. You've got to participate through the lens of being involved in multidimensional issues. You can't stick to one issue and you can't stick to going to the one party you believe advocates for you on that one issue. You need to reach out to all parties and you need to have a pragmatic type of approach. And you have to show that you're interested in more than one very limited policy area because you might not find common ground on that one policy area, but you might find common ground on another area. And let's, let's look at uh, an example. You, you may be a faith group that has a very strong pro-life position, and you may not find many people uh, or almost anyone in my liberal caucus that, that would agree with you on the fact that the laws should be uh, changed to restrict abortion rights. But you may find common ground with us on a multiplicity of other issues uh, that, 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 for example, there are many faith communities that I work with on a constant basis related to human trafficking. And, and that is something where you will have large support across party lines on your position that we need to do everything we can to protect people from human trafficking. You may find common ground on the issue of hate speech where you are concerned as a faith group that you are being attacked online and that social media providers are doing nothing or very little uh, to, 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 to safeguard your rights. You may find a lot of common ground on standing up, for example, for the Baha'i community that Jeff is a great representative of about the horrendous treatment that the Iranian regime is according to the Baha'i community. And, 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 and that we need all as political parties to stand up against the Ayatollah Khamenei and his propagation of hate against that community. Um, and, and so where communities reach out and say, look, we may not agree on this one issue, but we agree on many others. Let's talk about how we can work together on the issues we do agree with. You then may be surprised at how much you develop relationships that help you on those issues that you think 
the person's mind is maybe closed on. So I've had interactions with faith communities that I agree with on many things and others that I don't, but I always try to accord them the respect that they deserve. And, and I think that, that that is the main obligation of the politician. A politician to me has an obligation to meet with faith communities and organizations that they don't agree with and to cordially explain why they have differences in philosophy, not to simply shut the door and not take meetings with groups that they don't agree with. And, and that is where I would fault people of political orthodoxy on, on, on many sides where I, I know a number of colleagues that do not take meetings with groups that they don't agree with. And I think that's, that's wrong. I think we should be talking to everyone. And I think that's a lesson that faith communities can teach us because we understand within our own faith communities that there's a wide variety of positions within our own faith community on almost every issue. I think that uh, you've, 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 you've gone right to the, the, the area, uh, Anthony, that, that I was getting feedback from uh, the national faith communities that, you know, we're, I've given other commercial that will be meeting tomorrow as part of the festival. They said to me, they said, you're moderating this. I want you to ask all the, the panelists and I'll, I'll, I'll get Elizabeth and Garnet to, uh, to comment on this. What is it that they do? Sometimes it's more educational to put it this way. What do they do wrong? What do faith communities do wrong? They're anxious to uh, engage with parliamentarians. They're anxious to bring forward their, their public policy views. And you, you picked up on that in your, uh, in, your, in your response. So I don't know, Elizabeth and Garner, you wanna talk about, I mean, you can put it in the, what do they do right? But sometimes it's more instructive to say, what are, what are some of the traps to avoid if they wanna have that dialogue and that, uh, that influence? So Elizabeth, I don't know if you're. Well, I, I, I wouldn't wanna start any conversation as an MP saying, what do groups that come to talk to me do wrong? I think all of us are gonna say, well, wait a minute. Uh, coming to talk to us at all is doing something right. And it's our job to be, and I completely agree with Anthony, it, it, I, I, I don't think I've turned down meetings. It's, a, it's, um, it takes up, you know, it takes up a lot of time to meet with this. You have no idea, those of you watching this, maybe some of you do, but between industry lobbies and, and organizations advocating for good causes, you've got literally um, nonstop demands on your time, but that is your job. That's my job as an MP is to listen and to learn from people. And I've never had a meeting with anyone where I didn't learn something important. So I think I can't say that I'd want to start the answer to the question, not because I'm ducking it, John, because I just can't think in, in coming to talk to MPs, any conversation that's open and respectful is valuable. And I don't think anybody comes into an MP's office uh, with the intent of insulting the person they're talking to. So it's, it's a very, it's important to have a two-way street. It's important to have a conversation. And I wouldn't say anyone's doing anything wrong. If, if anything, the groups that do something wrong is, a, is it to assume, oh, I don't want to bother talking to that person because they're in that party, so we know where they're coming from. Uh, you don't know where anyone is coming from till you sit down and open up and, and exchange ideas. And I think that's what we're trying to say in terms of, and I know someone posted in the chat box, how could groups of faith participate in an interreligious uh, caucus, if we're able to pull this together, and uh, in COVID is certainly a barrier to having some of our normal conversations. I mean, I would love to have an interreligious uh, caucus where uh, communities of faith could come and we could have a, a seminar that focused on an issue that tried to say, well, how are we informed in our approach to this issue by, by, our, by our religion, by our faith, by the questions we ask of our religion? Because I think, I think uh, the people of faith are also uh, questioning and, and, and not, not always sure that they found all the answers. I, I don't think I've found all the answers, but I've got a good place to go look for them. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there and see what, what Garnet thinks. Well, thank you, Yathe. This is a, a, a good question. I, uh, I just pick up off a couple points that, that Elizabeth made. Uh, I, I agree that there's, there's great value in saying yes to the meeting. And if you're the external group asking for the meeting, I mean, I think the, the biggest thing people do wrong is uh, fail to engage, uh, fail to reach out. Um, you know, you, you, uh, you have to sometimes just dive right in, right? Like you do, it's, it's, uh, we're, we're, we're human beings, you know, you got, you got a local MP, even if you didn't vote for them, even if you think that they're, they're totally contrary to where you're going from a, from a philosophical perspective, 
reach out, have the conversation, talk to them. Uh, I think, uh, you know, and, and there are certain issues where uh, there'll be a party position and you might sit down with someone and realize, um, you know, th th this person's actually, I mean, m maybe they, they do agree with me, maybe, maybe they don't, but they're at a sort of point of personal angst or struggling with the issue. And, and rather than uh, not meet with them or, or, uh, or call them out, uh, you, can, you can engage them and, and in some ways uh, make the case to them. Um, so what, what should guide the engagement of, of people of faith? I'll, I'll, I'll draw from a text in the, in the Christian tradition um, uh, where G Jesus says, they, they will know you are my followers by your love. Uh, and I, I think that's important because it's not, you know, they will, they will know you are my followers by your position on euthanasia. And it's not, they will know you are my followers uh, by your commitment to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. It's, it's uh, they will know you are my uh, followers by your love. Uh, but love, we, we also have to understand, is a, is a rich uh, and, 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 uh, and deep concept. It's not just superficial love. I think it's Dostoevsky who says uh, uh, love is a, is a harsh and dreadful thing. He says, he says in the Brother Karamazov, love, love in reality is a harsh and dreadful thing uh, compared to love in dreams. Uh, that is for us to, as politicians uh, and then as advocacy groups, to really live out uh, authentic love uh, that requires a, uh, a, a willingness to engage a genuine empathy and compassion, a desire to connect with politicians, uh, but also a, a firmness and constancy in, in the pursuit of, of what is just and right. That if you have an elected official uh, who, who uh, is doing something that is, that is deeply injurious to the common good and, and that is negatively affecting people's lives as a result, uh, you are called to show love for them as a person and in your engagement with them, but also show love for the people that are adversely affected uh, by their failures on policy. And it might lead you to lovingly say to someone, uh, I will never vote for you uh, because of your position on issue X, but I still uh, would love for you to come to my house for dinner. Um, that's, that's something that maybe more politicians need to hear is that kind of uh, uh, harsh and dreadful love uh, for for them uh, in in the fullness of of uh, of what's required for us as uh, as, as people of faith and, and to, to the extent that people err in their engagement, I think they can maybe err on either side of this sort of narrow road of what what real love constitutes. Some people are are, are too harsh uh, in, in and, and they and they don't have that kind of loving uh, aspect surrounding their engagement. Some people can be so soft that they they have one uh, you know, warm handshake with a politician and they vote for them, even if they're doing everything wrong on all the issues that they care about. So, uh, so finding the, uh, the mean between those extremes is I think really important. Do you want to jump in, Anthony? Well, I mean, I think, he, I, I, John, I was wondering, do you, do you have some other questions that you wanted to ask us? Because we're, we're talking, but we're not really getting to questions that you may have lined up. So whatever you prefer. Oh, I just, I just wanted to give you, because I sort of picked up on, on one of the things you, say, you said at the end. We have, and I, I, for those of you who are watching, uh, uh, please submit your uh, uh, um, uh, questions. I must tell all our panelists, we're getting all sorts of positive. They're all beginning by saying, this is great. We love this. So, uh, uh, but I just wanted to give you a chance to respond, because I kind of I took one of your, your points and kind of expanded on it. But, well, uh, I, mean, I, 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 I mean, I agree. I generally agree with what both Garnet and Elizabeth said, right? I mean, I think that you need to engage. Groups need to meet with politicians who they think may not be on their side on issues. And the way to rally them is to find places where you have common ground, which means that you have to look to their background, you have to look to their public statements, and you have to know coming into a meeting where you have common ground and that's a good place to start. And, um, and, and, and I, I agree with what Elizabeth said, which is that you don't wanna tell people what not to do in a meeting or what they're doing wrong or insult anyone. But, but I do think that the, probably the, the, the biggest flaw that, that I've seen um, with groups that have come to meet with me is where they've done no research whatsoever into my background um, and what I've said on the issue that they're coming to meet me about um, and, and, and that therefore are, are presenting things to me that I could easily point out that says I've actually sponsored a bill on that issue last year. And, and that's, that's what's frustrating that they don't, they don't do their homework. We should be doing our homework on those meeting with us and they should be doing some homework on, 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 on who they're meeting with and not just come with a canned presentation that they're delivering the same thing to 300 different people. But beyond that, 
I, I think that the most important thing is, as, as both Elizabeth and Garnet said is reach out. You never make a mistake by asking for a meeting and a politician never makes a mistake by accepting a meeting because in the end result, you learn from any meeting that you engage in. And faith communities in Canada should not be embarrassed to be on the public sphere. There should be no reason that Catholic groups, that Anglican groups, that Jewish groups, that Muslim groups, that Sikh groups, that Hindu groups, that any group that represent a faith community or even better, an interfaith community where they've gotten together and come across religious lines, seek to meet with politicians. Uh, while we not, may not be the United States where people in politics still wear religion on their sleeve, nor should we be closed to the idea of religion being on the public sphere the same way that any other group would be on the public sphere. Religious groups need to be treated equally and with the same respect as we give organized labor or employers groups or environmental groups or anyone else that seeks a meeting with a politician. And, and that, if, if there's any message that I would give and I constantly give my colleagues, is that faith is not the be all and end all, but it needs to be treated with exactly the same respect as any other community coming to plead its message to politicians. And I, I think that's a, um, uh, I want to turn now to, because that actually uh, builds nicely into some of the questions. Uh, and again, folks watching this, please uh, submit your questions. I'm trying to, to, to uh, bundle them together. But there's been a, a, a number of questions about maybe the mechanics, if I can call it that. Uh, what exactly is a all-party interfaith caucus? Um, there was reference to the fact that in past parliaments, there have been other efforts to establish them uh, uh, without maybe that much success. Uh, what didn't work in the past? What would, what would be different about this? And then uh, how could faith groups uh, uh, contribute or, or engage with them? So that's picking up on and some of what you said at the end, Anthony, but I, we're just wondering about the mechanics and I appreciate Elizabeth, you mentioned with COVID and everything, you know, things are on maybe a little bit of a slower track, but, but any of the three of you wanna jump in on, on sort of what this thing could look like and how it would meet and sort of next steps. I note that one of our colleagues from Parliament, and I wanna have a shout out to Kathy Wagenthal because she's, she holds together our Wednesday morning prayer breakfast, and I see she's somewhere on that participants list. Um, and also Willard Metzger from the Mennonites, who does a lot of really great work that and intersects with politicians a lot. So I mean, there are a lot of people I'm, on this participants list who would love, I'm sure, to jump in and say a few things here. I think how it would work ideally would be a bit of time for us privately for reflection and a bit of time for a more um, public engagement. Um, it's, I think, the opportunity to have an interreligious dialogue as opposed to interfaith because faith is, is theist and not all religions are theists. So we need to make sure we, we pick our right language and we're really it, it opening up the space to say, how would we, how do our perspectives as policymakers, how are we informed from, from our own positions of faith? And I would not, and religion, I would not be at all surprised if we found over and over and over again that the interreligious perspective and lens led us to more or less the same kind of landing space in public discourse. But I would like to see us have an interreligious caucus that met privately um, and, and prayerfully. And I'd like to see us have an opportunity now and then where at least several times a year, we had a, a panel and a discussion that invited in other voices of unelected people, uh, so that so that the the sharing flows in a couple different directions, and I think that would, I, I certainly know that um, the the weekly prayer breakfast. I'm speaking for myself, it, which is I said exclusively Christian, which I think is 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 fills a need, but I'd really love to have it be an interreligious moment. It, it's my family I'm from and help. Uh, and, and it's once a week that we that we pray together. It it's something that most Canadians wouldn't know was even remotely possible, that, that, that there's such a strong bond between people who uh, on issues, we agree maybe on very little, but as a family, we know we approach the, 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 the power of prayer from the same perspective. And it's, it's been an important part of my life as an MP since I first joined it when I was elected in 2011. And I'm, um, I'd love to see 
we have to, I'm not trying to change that. I want to keep my Wednesday morning prayer breakfast in place, but I'd love to see us have the opportunity to exchange more from an interreligious perspective. Garnet or Anthony? Uh, yeah, I mean, I may well just say on the, on the mechanics of the of, of the group, you know, I think the most important thing for this is as we as we get this this process started that uh, there there are a lot of different friendship groups and associations on Parliament Hill. And for the most part, uh, they give people an opportunity to go back and tell other people, look, I'm a member of the, uh, you know, Canada Pacific Ocean uh, Friendship uh, Committee. We met once to elect the chair and uh, that's about it. Um, so my, my <laughs> um, and, and that's, I, I'm just being brutally honest, right? But that's, that's, that's some of the reality of these groups. So, so um, I, I think it's, it's, th this is an important forum. It's an important opportunity uh, and it's important for us to make it meaningful, which means regular conversations, regular events. It doesn't necessarily mean every week, uh, although it could, um, it, it, it means, uh, you know, using this as a vehicle to get to the bottom of important issues and challenges. I think that's what we're going to have to flesh out. And uh, just to, I mean, I guess, and in, in with this, I, look, I agree with what Garnet said. There's tons and tons of groups on Parliament Hill. Um, and, and what I would love to see, I don't think that necessarily that this Faith Caucus will be the only forum or the, or, or maybe even the best forum, is in the United States, legislators have something called a problem solving caucus, which is a group of people that get together across party lines, usually people that are in the middle of their parties um, and not, you know, and not people that, you know, that are, that, that are really at the extreme left or the extreme right. And they get together when there's disagreement about legislation and try to flesh out compromises. And I think that's really what I find missing from Canadian politics, that parties get together, they take a position, and then as a member of the party, you're expected to follow your party leadership on whatever position they have taken, which probably you weren't included in the discussion about unless it was your own area of, of, of expertise. Um, and, and that is, is frustrating. It's one of the reasons that I actually like the American congressional system a little bit better than, than our parliamentary system in a way, because you, know, you don't have the executive branch sitting there and you're able to flesh out compromises on legislation. And so if we are ever able in Canada to come to a way that we have a problem solvers caucus where you get people from each party that actually take a realistic approach to legislation and look at how to bridge divides between parties, um, I think that would be a really interesting organization. And if there's any way the faith caucus could, could, could take a lead on that, that would be uh, wonderful. No, th thank you. I want to switch just a little bit. I'm, I'm trying to work my way through. We've got lots of interest, lots of questions. This one is a little bit of a challenge. It says the conversation has been white and Judeo-Christian, uh, Abrahamic and at best monotheistic in its framing, apart from Elizabeth Peter Timmerman reference. Could panel members speak to broader faith understanding, Turtle Island, Indigenous, Hindu, Buddhist, etc., and how all traditions intersect with ethno-racial identity, i.e. the intersection of faithism and uh, racism? So I will throw that out to the panel. I'm not sure who wants to start. Well, I'll just, I'll just jump quickly in and say, yes, absolutely. The um, Indigenous worldview perspective is critically needed and is, um, it, as is, you know, Buddhist, Hindu, as I said earlier, I like to stick to interreligious dialogue because as soon as you say interfaith, you're in uh, the three major theist religions and not expanding as the questioner points out. So the, if we're having an interreligious discussion, it, absolutely the voices of um, various other religions. I mean, there's so many that, uh, that uh, but particularly here on Turtle Island and on indigenous lands, our, our conversations need to be informed by indigenous worldview perspectives. It's, uh, it's extremely, um, well, it's, it's needed, but also ex I find confirmatory of where I come from in faith is, is every time I, I pray with indigenous leadership, I find it uh, extremely Elizabeth, you become muted for. Uh... Oh, I don't know. I touched something. I'm sorry. Wherever I left off, it was probably good. I stopped talking. <laughs> Garnet or, or, or Anthony on the question. Garnet, you're. 
Sure, I, I can just go next. I mean, I, mean, I like I, I don't know if I agree with the characterization that this conversation has been been white. I mean, I think we've been we've been all speaking to a greater extent from our own traditions, um, which is uh, which is natural because uh, you know people uh, the the. the the, the saying in this this space maybe is that the love of the universal is grounded in the love of the particular that we start by learning uh, our own traditions and it is through an appreciation of our own traditions that we also gain an appreciation uh, for for other people's uh, traditions uh, i mean i'll note when you, when you speak about christianity i mean uh probably the the vast majority of people at this point in the world who are practicing christians uh, are are not white and uh uh Christianity comes out of the the particular cultural moment of of a heavy degree of of oppression. It was it was the faith in in the first instance and uh, for for the early part of its history of of oppressed people uh, who were who were championing the principle of of uh, of universal human dignity against uh, uh, the authoritarian privilege of of the Roman elites. So uh, I think that's that. That might be important in terms of of, of qualifying that uh, that description of what, what we're talking about. But but look for me, um, you know, being a Catholic, starting from uh, an appreciation of my own traditions, leads me to a recognition of the importance of religion in in uh, in, in people's lives, uh, and therefore an interest in understanding and digging deeper uh, into the the religion uh, ideas and motivations of other. Uh, communities. Uh, and so when I engage in discussion about human rights in China, for example, I very often intentionally draw on the Confucian tradition. Uh, because I, I think that the Confucian tradition is being deeply misused uh, by the authoritarian uh, regime in China. That there's such a an intellectual richness in Confucianism uh, that, that is actually deeply at odds with the sort of values of a of a materialist uh, Marxist system, uh, and and you can see that in my speeches and my writings about it, um, you know, and uh, and and my engagement with the um, you know with the, the Sikh and the Hindu community as well. I, I think if you if you dig into these things and you under you understand faith, faith traditions, that gives you such a, a richer understanding of 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 what is what is really going on. I think one one application of this uh, concretely is, uh, and and the questioner asked about kind of the intersection between uh, religious discrimination and and racism. Um, I, I I've been involved in foreign policy issues uh, quite a bit, and and I'm a big believer in in the importance and the legitimacy of uh, diaspora communities being involved in our foreign policy conversations. Uh, the people that are informed by a faith perspective as well as a cultural experience. Uh, that gives them a, a richer understanding of what may be happening in other parts of the world and therefore advocate for Canada to be uh, present in those spaces in a way that, that also at, advances uh, human rights and human dignity. Um, I, I think that that voice is very important. And I found in, in my early years as, as a parliamentarian, this sort of uh, snooty dismissal of diaspora perspectives. That was particularly evident during the debate on the Office of Religious Freedom, uh, where you had people saying this is this is diaspora politics and therefore we should have no part of it. Uh, well, hang on. I mean, if, if people who are Canadians, who, who, who are parts of religious and or ethnic minorities, uh, think this is an important expression of our values, uh, why isn't it legitimate for them to be part of the, the foreign policy conversation? Why, why, why should uh, their voice be excluded in favor of, uh, of, of people who think they have foreign policy qualifications, but have much less connections to the actual experience on the ground? So I think that's maybe this sort of silly dismissal of diaspora perspectives is, is one example concretely of how uh, racism and anti-religious discrimination kind of intersect to try and marginalize people who, who have really important things to offer as we shape our foreign policy. Anthony, do you want to jump in? Uh, sure. I mean, I, I think like Garnet, I just kind of push back at that characterization of our description. We, we didn't choose the panelists. You guys did. And you happen to choose three people who happen to be white, who come from a Judeo-Christian tradition. Um, but that doesn't mean I think that any of our discussion today has been centered around our own faiths at, at all. I, th I, th I think, for example, I haven't even talked about the fact that I'm Jewish whatsoever. But the fact that I am Jewish and I come from a minority tradition in Canada, and the fact that I'm an English-speaking Quebecer and come from a minority language group in Canada has characterized the way that I see the Canadian experience for many, many other groups who are also living in minority situations, whether Indigenous Canadians, racialized Canadians, um, people from traditions that are far less popular in Canada than Judaism, et cetera. And, and I understand having lived as a double minority all of my life 
in, in a province where sometimes, you know, the use of religion or the use of language has been used as a sword against minorities um, has led me to have an empathy and an understanding for minority viewpoints everywhere in Canada, whether it's the spiritual tradition of Indigenous peoples, whether it's the Baha'i faith that is even a smaller faith than Judaism in Canada or, or, or other faiths. Um, so I, I think we've been taking a pretty universalist approach to things. And I think as Elizabeth has said, whatever caucus we're going to form is going to be a caucus that is welcoming of all traditions uh, across the spectrum, whether religious, spiritual or otherwise, because that's the only way you get to know your colleagues and it's the only way that you respect all of the different traditions, because again, I, I think it's true to say that we're, 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 we're in a false dichotomy when we constantly try to you know, claim that Canada is, is, is a secular state. We are secular, but we're also multi-religious, multi-spiritual, and we should be recognizing everybody in however we characterize our country. Can I uh, pick up one of the questions that came in? It's, it's, it's turning our entire conversation around. It says, um, what about uh, sort of a general lack of sufficient public trust in individuals without any religious faith? And they kind of, uh, I don't know, maybe stick, focus a little bit by saying, is there a visibly atheist group of MPs who would feel comfortable introducing themselves as atheists and having weekly breakfast gatherings? So I think within that, and this is picking up on some of the comments you made, what about those uh, 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 politicians who, 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 you know, they may not have a faith tradition, but it may in fact be, be more than that. They may consider themselves very uh, firm atheists. How, how do they fit into, into the equation and, and the dialogue? Garnet? No, you can, oh, yeah. I, I was just going to say, um, you know, first of all, I think we need to firmly assert that religious freedom includes the right not to believe uh, in, a, in a traditional sense, that, that uh, freedom of religion is the freedom to look at the world around you, to look, look up at the sky and try to come to honest conclusions about uh, what, what is happening, what is the, you know, what, what is the meaning and purpose, if any, of, of, uh, of what we're doing. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, I mean, the other thing I'd say about, about atheists is that they, they come in so many different shapes and sizes, right? Uh, there are people who uh, are, are identify as atheists who, who have deep, uh, you know, prior moral commitments. Uh, and then there are people who, who connect to their, their atheism, a, um, uh, you know, a, a sense that, that, uh, uh, a, a sort of quasi quasi nihilism. So, so, and I don't mean to suggest that, that that there's there's any any one specific. I mean, there's there's a whole there's a whole spectrum there. Uh, I think the barriers that that atheists face in politics are a little bit different, though. Um, in that, a lot of us who get elected, we come initially with the support of of communities, communities of people that we are a part of, through which we know people that get behind us and support us. I think the, the, the bigger barrier that atheists face is not, um, you know, is, is not that necessarily their perspective is unwelcome in Parliament, uh, but it's that uh, they, they don't necessarily have a, I mean, there, there aren't uh, temples of reason. I mean, this is sort of a trend during the French Revolution, people trying to create these sort of quasi church organizations that were communities of atheists. Um, that never really took off, though, right? So if, if, if a, a person who's from a Christian or Jewish or Sikh uh, tradition, uh, they may draw from their community at those initial stages of organizing. Uh, and that's something that, uh, that, that atheists uh, may have less access to in terms of that community. Uh, there may be exceptions to that, but I think that's, that's maybe, it's, it's, a, it's a different set of challenges and barriers, I think. Elizabeth, do you wanna comment? Yeah, just to jump oh. in, if I, if I can, John. Sure. Um, I, I mean, I, I think freedom of religion means the freedom to have whatever religion you choose or the freedom to have no religion and the freedom to not believe or the freedom to believe. Agnostics, atheists, or people of any faith uh, are all supposed to be equal and all supposed to be equally welcome, which is why quiet contemplation, like we have before the House of Commons uh, meets every day, does not need to be for prayer. It could be to quietly contemplate the beauty of the surroundings around us, how lucky we are to be in such an august chamber and to be chosen by Canadians and to make us contemplate the awesome responsibility we have to make laws for the country. 
Um, you know, Garnet is correct. Of course, when people are seeking nominations, often they seek support from their own faith communities. But in my case, I, I sought support from my swim teams. I sought support from my drama society that I was part of. Um, I'm not particularly a religious person at all. I, I mostly go to church and to synagogue uh, because it's my job as a politician to make sure that I am going to see all of my constituents in their own uh, places where they feel comfortable. And to be honest, I've been to more masses in the last year than I've been to synagogue ser services. Um, so so, so, so in, the, in the end result, um, I don't think there's a discrimination against atheists and agnostics in Canada. Um, I think it may be less important for people who have no faith to voice that. Um, but, but, but I certainly would be the first if somebody who was an atheist or an agnostic came to tell me that they felt discriminated against or unappreciated or disrespected in some way and I had a way to help them, I would definitely try to do so because I believe freedom of religion also encompasses that very same freedom to not believe. Elizabeth, here. Yeah, I totally agree with what Anthony's just said. And it's, I mean, we also mustn't make assumptions in an interreligious dialogue, including Buddhists. Buddhists aren't theists. So if you're going to say, well, this, then there are the atheists or the agnostic, but it, 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 each, I mean, everybody has a personal perspective. But my husband just self describes as atheist and Buddhist. Um, and, you know, we have, I mean, it, actually, it's it, we have interesting conversations, and that's the point: is to have the conversation. Um, and but, but I'm sure that many of our colleagues they don't describe themselves as atheists, but pushed for a minute, they'd say, "Well, no, I don't believe in God." It's very funny that you guys do, but let's have a conversation. Um, but in terms of an interreligious dialogue, my my sense of what we want to do is have that conversation between and among people who describe themselves as having a religious tradition. And that conversation is a rich one. Uh, I would not ever want to suggest for one minute that, the, that those people who have decided for themselves that they don't see themselves in any religion or faith, that's absolutely an essential part of any democracy that we don't decide, decide that some people have views that are more valuable than others. But the conversation around uh, an interreligious dialogue does tend to presuppose that we're talking to people who come from different religious traditions. And that's a pretty, I mean, when you consider that just within Christianity, there are 2000 different denominations. We've got a lot of rich territory to cover in sharing and opening up and examining how that informs who we are as human beings. And that's a, a conversation we don't have often enough. I, basically just one little quick thought because of COVID, I haven't been able to go to church since March. So when Anthony was saying, he goes, I've been missing being at church so much. And then the, uh, uh, the church, that I attend when I'm in Ottawa for Parliament, decided to start having services again. And our sacrament has changed now because you wear the mask and the priest finally gets close enough to give you a wafer. So our sacrament and our liturgy is now it. We receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ and then you take your mask. And, and then of course, the second sacrament is the second minister, assistant minister coming with a hand sanitizer. So I'm <laughs> thinking, okay, we're, we're, we're adapting, but I sure miss what I think of as real communion. At least the collection plate doesn't come around as often anymore. <laughs> Listen, you can always I, give online, Anthony. Yeah, we're. Uh, listen, this has been a wonderful conversation. We've got lots more questions, lots more interest in this. Uh, uh, but un un unfortunately, there's a tight time schedule here. Uh, I really want to thank uh, our three uh, panelists. You've uh, covered such a wide range of, of uh, uh, topics under this umbrella of, of faith and public life. And I think you've uh, uh, allowed us to get a glimpse of these plans for. Uh, uh, this all-party caucus, and uh, I think a very, very positive contribution to this. Um, I'm going to end, as I say, by thanking everyone, by thanking uh, 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 Jeff Cameron for, for his help, but also putting in another commercial for tomorrow when uh, we're going to have uh, a number of uh, faith leaders uh, respond to what they heard today and to this general uh, issue. Uh, it's going to include representatives from the National Council of Canadian Muslims, the World Sikh Organization, the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs, the Canadian Council of Churches, the Baha'i uh, Community of Canada, 
It's uh, 11 o'clock and it's through the Democracy Exchange Festival. So you can find that information on the website. So once again, thank you for our panelists. You're busy people and we really appreciate you taking uh, the time to uh, uh, come forward. And uh, this has been a wonderful conversation and I hope, I hope we can continue it as uh, uh, plans for this uh, caucus evolve. So thank you all very much. I can say out loud, God bless you. Thank you.